Okay, thank you all for the introduction. So uh, let me begin with uh, motivation. Imagine that you are a pilot. So this is how your dashboard looks like. And you have a small screen there where, where they show you the map of your next target. However, you know, bandwidth to, to uh, airplanes is quite limited. And it's possible that the situation looks like that. There is some, some information that you have already received, some information that is being received now, and the future information you have no idea. And the question, well, you already see the red mark, but the question is, do you believe it? So can we authenticate the data that has been received so far? So what we want is that maybe beside of the information that we're just receiving right now, maybe except for this information, you want to be quite sure that the past information is authenticated. And as time goes by, you want your guarantee of this uh, data to increase, and you want to be sure with higher probability that this is indeed the correct information. Okay, so let me be slightly more formal about uh, our model. So I'll begin by explaining what data stream is, which might be new to some of you. So a data stream is just a very, very long message, maybe infinite. And the second uh, difference between data stream and a message is that we don't know the data stream in advance. So the data, we, we just learn the data stream in an online manner. At the first time step, time step we uh, learn the first bit. At the second time step, we learn the second bit, and so on. OK, so um, our problem is the following. Alice learns some stream in an online manner bit by bit, one bit at a time, and she wants to communicate this bit over to Bob. However, the communication channel has some noise. So we assume we have some adversary, uh, which is all powerful, but is limited only by the amount of noise that uh, this adversary can, can make. And we want two things. First, we want Bob to be able to deal with the noise, so to be able to decode the data. This has the flavor of uh, error correcting. But on top of that, we want Bob to be able to learn the correct data and to be able to say which part of the data is indeed correct and which is not probably incorrect. And this has a flavor of authentication. OK, and so how do we, think, how do we authenticate or perform error correction of a, a, for a data stream over a noisy channel? If I ask you this question, I guess most of you will come up with two trivial solutions. So the first solution would probably be take the, take the stream and perform some, add some egg to it or perform some error correction uh, on the stream. Well, as I said, a stream is a very, very long message and probably infinite. So we actually, this solution is uh, uh, not possible. The second solution that most of you will come up, I'm sure, would be the following. Take the stream, cut it into small chunks, and perform some, you know, add mark or perform some error correction on each chunk separately. This is actually quite a, a nice solution, but it has, it has this problem. So let's assume the adversary comes and completely corrupts one, one of the chunks. So you see that the information in that chunk is lost. Bob will never be able to recover this information. However, the noise that the adversary made is, is very small. So we have here a difference between the, the global noise that the adversary make, uh, might do, which is restricted, and the local noise that the adversary might do, which uh, is kind of, uh, can be very high. Another issue with that is that once we, we split, the chunk, uh, split the stream into chunks, then all that we know, uh, um, all the guarantee we have about one chunk is restricted to that block. So it is not the case that as we get more and more information, our uh, guarantee about the correctness of one, of one chunk will increase, or it's not true that we will be able to recover uh, the errors by having more information. Okay, so let me be slightly more uh, formal about the model. So our encoding model is the following. At time t, Alice learns some uh, bit of the stream, and then she transmits our symbols from some alphabet that I call gamma, and we will focus only on constant rate schemes. So we want R and the size of the alphabet gamma to be constant. Our noise model, so we will say that the rate of noise is C, which is some constant between 0 and 1. If up to time n, for, for any time n, the 
uh, amount of noise, sorry, the fraction of, of symbols that were corrupted is at most C. And also we assume that the parties share some uh, secret key. This will be used for the authentication. Okay, so now let me begin with, with a simple uh, observation and ask how much can we decode at all? So, so consider the following situation. Let's assume that at some time n, that's the, the stream that Alice sent over to Bob, and then the adversary comes and completely corrupts the last CN symbols. So it's kind of clear that there is no hope to decode more than uh, a prefix which is longer than one minus C n. So from this point on, I will, instead of saying a prefix whose length is one minus C n, I will just say to decode one minus C fraction of the stream. So there is no hope to decode more than one minus C fraction of the stream. So this is our, actually our first result, which is an impossibility result. We say that for any rate noise C, there is no hope to get a constant rate protocol that will recover more than one minus C fraction of the stream. However, more interesting than this impossibility result is our positive result. We actually show that it is possible to achieve at least one minus C fraction of, this, of, this, of the stream. So um, for every noise level C, we show an efficient scheme which has constant rate and as long as the noise is below this, this parameter C, we will be able to, recall, to recover a prefix of the stream uh, with, uh, whose length is at least one minus C n uh, up to small uh, epsilon. And this succeeds except with polynomially small probability. How do we get this scheme? Uh, we do it by combining two codes. One code, uh, we call it the Blueberry code, and this is it would be a, a, a weak MAC, weak message authentication code. The other one uh, we call the tree code. This is a code that will deal with the errors. It's error correction code. And now let me just explain each one of them and what do they do. So the Blueberry code is just the following thing. Um, every time that Alice wants to send a bit, she will just map it into some larger alphabet. But she will map it in a random way so that the adversary doesn't know uh, the mapping. Only Alice and Bob, they will use their authentication key to, to, uh, to do this random mapping. Now, assume that Alice uh, has zero, so she sends this symbol. Now, if the adversary tries to uh, change the symbol, with constant probability, he will change the symbol to one of the, the dots here that don't have an incoming error. In this case, Bob will be able to catch the, to catch the corruption and say, okay, something wrong here that that was a corruption. In this case, we, we will call it an erasure. The transmission is marked as an erasure, and Bob knows that this is a corrupted uh, transmission. The thing about erasures that, uh, from the point of view of error correcting, erasures are much more easy to handle than, uh, than errors. Okay, the second code is three codes as defined by Schulman in 93. This is just a, a code, it's a way to encode a string in an online manner. So practically this is just a tree uh, where every e edge has some label attached to it. And if we have some string to encode, we just begin at the root. And uh, so if the first bit is zero, we go to the zero uh, child of the root and encode zero as the label W zero. And then we will take the one child because the bit is one and encode it as, the, as this label. However, the labels of, of this tree are not just arbitrary labels, they have some nice property, and the property is the following. So start at any point, uh, any node in the tree, and take two paths that go down from this node of the same length, then the labels on this path will have a large Hamming distance. So in this case, the Hamming distance of this, the labels here and the labels here will be larger than alpha L, where L is the length of the path and alpha is some parameter of the tree that we can choose between uh, zero and one. This is how strong the code is. And what's nice about the, these tree codes is that it has um, this property of self-recovery from errors. 
So assume that we use Trico to communicate some string. This is like the correct uh, path that the string uh, that we communicate is. And assume that at the beginning there were plenty of errors. So Bob might, might think that we are here. He might make the code this path because of the errors. But then all the transmission uh, were received correctly. Now know that any extension of this path, so the Hamming distance of this path and that path is, is actually large. And since there were not too many errors, then the, the word that Bob receives will be closer to the correct path. So at this point, Bob will be able to, to decode uh, the entire path correctly. So this is a self-recovery property. However, the, this, uh, to decode a tree code, uh, we cannot do it efficiently. So decoding a tree code might take exponential time in the depth of the tree. That's, that's one problem that tree codes have. Okay, so now um, uh, the claim is that if we combine tree codes and blueberry code, we will get our authentication scheme. So what do I mean by that? Alice, the encoding uh, will look like that. If Alice has this string, uh, the stream, first she will use a tree code and encode each bit as a label, and then she will use the blueberry code to map each label into a, a larger alphabet. And as long as the noise is less than C for any time n, we will be able to recover at least one minus C fraction of the stream. Why is that? So let's assume that those were the symbols that Alice sent to Bob, and some of them got corrupted, they are marked in, in red, the first thing that Bob does will be to uh, decode the blueberry code. After the blueberry code, some of the, of the uh, corrupted symbols will become an erasures and some will become errors. And we can compute what is the expected amount of, of errors and what is the expected uh, amount of erasures. And note that once we know the expectation, then the event that we have, that the real number of errors is more than twice the expected amount, happens with negligible probability. So let's just denote the twice the expectation with E bar, and we will use it soon. So now I need to show you that we actually are capable of decoding at least one minus C fraction of the stream. So let's assume we don't. If we don't, it means that if that was the correct path, but we decoded something else, so we, the, the divergent point from the correct path and the path that we decoded must be above this line of Cn. So this is one minus C, and we, we decode something which is less than one minus C, so the divergent point is above this line. However, now we have two paths that start at the same node, so the labels of these two paths have large Hamming distance. Specifically, the Hamming distance is at least alpha Cn because the, the length is at least Cn. Now, in order for Bob to, to be confused between this uh, uh, path and this path, uh, that they have, um, that the Hamming distance is alpha Cn, the number of errors and, and, delete and erasures must satisfy this thing. So there must be enough errors and erasures to overcome the Hamming distance of uh, of these two streams. So we don't want this to happen. Uh, what we can do, we can choose the parameter alpha, so uh, this will not happen. So that's exactly what we do. We choose alpha to be larger than twice E bar plus D bar, where E bar is, uh, uh, just to remind you, is two times the expectation. So except with negligible probability, the amount of errors will be less than E bar, and this, this uh, um, equation will not be satisfied, which means that we will be able to decode more than one, one, one minus C fraction of the stream. However, the problem with, with uh, this encoding that it's not efficient because we use this uh, tree code, which takes exponential time to decode. Uh, but we can um, use these ideas to come up with an efficient scheme. So the idea here is uh, instead of using one very deep tree, we will use plenty of very shallow tree. So we will use a lot of trees, and each one of them uh, will be used to encode only log n bits, so decoding them uh, can be done in polynomial time. And there is some cleverness in how do we uh, pick at each time the right tree, and how do we take the stream and split it into trees, but this is doable. 
it's uh, just too many technical details that I don't have time to get into. Okay, so, um, yeah, so let me just say a couple more things about our results. So, um, as I mentioned in the theorem, I guess uh, uh, maybe I should restate it, the probability of success of, of the efficient scheme is one minus one over polynomial. But we are capable to have some extension and to increase our authentication guarantee uh, to, uh, to be two to the minus uh, n. Uh, what do I mean by that? So, so first, we, we just do it with some uh, standard techniques like adding hash, but we will obtain the following situation. So our scheme will still fail or, or um, abort with polynomially small probability. So Bob might say at some time, okay, I have too much errors, too many errors. I don't know what's going on. I'm aborting. And this will happen with polynomially small probability. However, if Bob didn't abort and he outputs some, you know, some outputs, the probability that this will not be what Ali sent him will be negligibly small. Um, so you can think about this part as the error correction part of our scheme and, uh, and this as the authentication part of the scheme. And this is um, the probabilities that we get. Okay, to, um, to complete uh, the talk, I, I will just mention that we actually find out that these uh, techniques can be used in other fields of communication. Uh, specifically, um, there is this question of uh, interactive communication, where two parties, Alice and Bob, just try to compute some function. And they, they do this, their conversation over a noisy channel, and try to compute an arbitrary function. And there is this result by Breverman and Rao, and they show that any function can be computed as long as the noise uh, level is less than uh, 1 over 4. And they give a protocol that makes it. So by using the Bloomberg code, uh, we were able to improve this uh, result of Breverman and Rao and show how to compute any function as long as the noise uh, is less than half. And we also, also show that this is tight. So uh, if the adversary has, uh, is capable of making more than half uh, noise, then he can actually completely block one of the parties, and there is no hope to, to be able to compute anything. So this is a tight result. Um, last thing is that uh, this is actually uh, Slightly interesting because one, when we were talking about one-way communication, like the data stream communication I told you uh, earlier, then we, in that case, the noise level could reach all the way up to one. But when we are in the two-way setting, the noise level uh, is bounded by half, which is a difference between the uh, one-way and two-way communication. Uh, that would be it. Thank you. Any questions? So the first you key is uh, kind of unbounded long. So I, I assume using the random functions, of course, you can make it short. Can you have an unconditional result with a key, let's say? Yes, so I didn't mention it, but, but we do show how you can uh, replace the, uh, you know, the, the long key just by a short key and, and using some props. I don't want to necessarily. So short generator. is log n or linear? Is it logarithmic or polylogarithmic? It's, it's, it's sublinear. But not polylogarithmic, I see. Yeah, I don't remember. 